Hello, welcome to the second webinar in our color quality control series. Today's topic is capturing digital color data. Presenting today is Tim Mao, our Applications Engineering and Technical Support Manager at XY Pantone. I'm Robert Grotans, the Global Technical Marketing Manager, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. For today's webinar, if at any point, if you have any questions, please use the questions form to submit your questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tim to get things started. Thank you, Robert, and welcome everyone. Um, as you can see on the title slide here, and we're talking about improving color quality control with digital color data. Another way of saying that is, how am I gonna measure this stuff? And choosing the right tool for the job, because there's more than one way to measure color. So let's talk about the specific things. So measuring color may require specific measurement methods to capture the needed data. And that can be affected greatly by what I'm measuring. Am I measuring something glossy versus something matte? Am I measuring something textured versus solid? Something bulky like carpet or fibers versus solid color? Am I measuring something liquid? <laughs> Am I measuring something transparent or translucent? Is it opaque? Does it have effects and change color with angle and all that? All of these things come into play and have to be considered. And the way that we might measure any one of these um, is different from the way we might measure another, or maybe they're similar. And it's affected greatly by the kind of instrument that I use. When we talk about instruments and the type of instrument we're gonna use, we're gonna talk about something called geometry. Yeah, it's uh, everybody's favorite uh, subject from school. What and um, here we're talking about what is instrument geometry. So when we talk about that, we're literally talking about the inner workings of how a device measures color. We'll be talking about where is the light located, where is the sample being seen, if you will, by the instrument, where is the measurement being taken, um, and how does that interpret color. And it's really, again, it's about choosing the right tool. So we might say, you know, I've got one of those screwdrivers where I can stick all these different heads in there, and so I can put in a Torx bit or a Robertson bit or anything else, right? Flathead, Phillips, um, all of those go into a screwdriver, but they're all different tools for different reasons. And the same thing can be said of spectrophotometers. They all measure color, but they measure color differently and for different um, reasons or giving us different results. So let's look at the geometries. So we'll start with what what's known as the 45-0 geometry. And really quick, when we're talking about instrument geometry, the first number we see is gonna tell us about a specific location of where the light is coming stuff, coming from, sorry. The second indication is where the measurement is coming from. So 45 means that the light is coming from a 45 degree angle. We can see that very easily right here. So it's 45 from perpendicular. So light is shining at that kind of an angle. The measurement or the receiver is then at zero degrees. That hence 45-0. Now on a 45-0 instrument, we've got light shining. Um, it's directional. Think of it like a spotlight. It's got a lens on it that's focusing a beam of light so that we only have light coming from the 45 degree angle. Um, this is a MetaView, X-ray MetaView instrument. It's an example of a 45-0 geometry instrument. So there's that type of instrument. Then we have what's called a sphere, or you'll see it's called D8. So remember, the first indicator is about where the light is coming from. The D in this case means diffuse. And you can see we have a light source there, like a light bulb. Um, and there's arrows coming off of it, yellow arrows showing where that light is shining. And you'll notice that the light bulb cannot shine down onto this, directly onto this blue sample. There's a, a baffle in the way because the light is shining on the walls of the sphere, which are a very reflective white substance. So the entire sphere turns into a light source, hence the name of this instrument. It's typically called a sphere, um, even though its geometry is actually D8. Again, D for diffuse, and then eight being eight degrees from perpendicular, that's where the sample port is, and we can take a measurement. Now, with this particular instrument, we've got some more in-depth to talk about. So putting a specimen at the reflectance port, 
um, like we're showing right now, we will get what's called a specular included or spin SCI, different ways to, to label the same thing, to measure that pure color without the effect of gloss. Sphere instruments also have the ability to measure in what's called specular component excluded or specs, SCE. Here at the opposite eight degree angle of where the detector will be, we have another port called the specular port. It allows us to let the light, to not have the effect of gloss, let the light that's reflecting due to gloss or specular reflectance not be included. What's specular reflectance? It's that. So that's a picture of something where you can see its color around the edges, but in the middle, all you see is what? The light shining back into your eye, because that's the specular angle. That's the gloss, right? Um, think of shining a light into a mirror, a flashlight into a mirror. It's going to bounce off at an equal opposite angle, very bright. That's specular reflectance or gloss. And of course, texture and all those things play into that as well. So we have benchtop models of instruments that use a sphere. Um, as well as handheld models that use a sphere. So let's talk just a little bit more about those two modes of measurement because it's pretty important stuff. So here's a picture of a single plastic chip. It's black, obviously. It's got two different gloss levels or surfaces. The top one is extremely glossy and smooth. The bottom one is matte and got very, very microscopic kind of texture on it that makes them look very different to our eye. Now, if I measure these in specular component included, I'm going to measure the color or the colorant in them. And it's actually going to see them as very, very close to one another. I can even do this visually. If I tip the sample to the right angle, I can get it to a specular included um, kind of view. And the that plastic chip will look like one color. If I measure those two in specular component excluded, where I'm excluding the gloss, well, what happens when I excluded the gloss? When I exclude the gloss, the glossy one looks really, really dark compared to the one that has low gloss because I'm letting a lot of light be excluded from the glossy one. Less light means darker. So um, if I do this, and I've actually done this with this chip and measured them, the delta E between the two of them in specular included is 0 0.83. I'm under one delta E. If I measure those two in specular component excluded, the delta E is over 20. Um, because that's what I see, and that's what's happening when I exclude the gloss from that. So here's how I remember the difference between those two. SCI, specular component included, ignores the gloss of the surface. Where excluded, specular component excluded, everything is color. So included ignores, everything is color. Okay? That's how we keep the included and the excluded straight. If you want more information about this particular um, topic, we have lots more um, information and ways to help you on our website, um, as well as we'll be happy to answer questions about that, as Robert said. So that's specular included and excluded. Let's go to the third kind of instrument that might be used to measure color, and that's a multi-angle instrument. And like its name sound, it's got multiple angles where we are measuring color. So we've got light at a single angle, 45 degrees. And you'll notice it's very similar to the 45-0 instrument in that it's got the light at a single angle. But now we're measuring at 15, 25, 45, 75, 110. And we have instruments that go all the way up to 12 angles. They put a second light in there and measure again. So those angles are to measure an, a, a color something like this, which might um, be of interest to us. Obviously, depending on what angle I measure that at, I get a different color. I can get a gold, I can get a bluish gray. Um, so those angles in automotive finishes, for example, are very important. So we've got handheld versions of that. This has, happens to be an MA5 QC device that will measure those, and essentially it's five spectrophotometers in one. So ultimately, choosing the right tool comes down to which one of those geometries is the right thing for what I'm measuring. So here's the things we've got to consider when we're selecting that tool. Will I be sharing or comparing data in a distributed workflow? 
if I am, the differences in the geometries and the illumination, think about that, the direct illumination, like a flashlight or a or a spotlight on a 45-0 versus a diffuse illumination from a sphere instrument, mean that the data between those is not compatible. Now, if I measure a red color with both instruments, they're both going to measure it as red, but they're not going to measure it identical, like the same red. So I can't compare my data with a 45-0 to your data with a sphere and get reliably accurate data because those difference, differences in how they're illuminated will create an incompatibility. So to start with, are you communi communicating with other people? If you are, you've got to all be using the same geometry. Second, are there industry standards, specification, or historical reasons that require a specific geometry? For example, do you have to conform to an ISO or an ASTM or a DIN or an A squared specification? If you do, they probably are specifying which instrument. Now, some of these will specify either type or multiple types of instruments that can be used. Sometimes it's very specific. And specific indices may require a specific geometry. So if you're doing some kind of very specialized kind of testing where you're not just doing standard C-Lab or LCH kind of measurements, but you're getting a specific kind of in, um, indice that you need to calculate, it may require a specific kind of instrument to do that. And do I have specific measurement needs that require a specific instrument? For example, am I doing transmission measurements? Well, if I am, that instantly means I need a bench top. You know, we've got a depiction there. A bench top is the one kind of instrument that allows me to not measure the light reflecting off the sample. Not only, I should say, measure the light reflecting off the sample, but also measure the light that's passing through the sample. So if I need to do a transmission measurement, that's going to dictate that I have to use a bench top sphere instrument. So thinking about that, how do we ensure then that I've chosen the right tool and that it's working properly and that the measurement is correct? It's all about care and maintenance of your device. So not, it's not only picking the instrument, but it's also making sure that, that instrument performs properly consistently and you can trust its results. So you can start with monthly profiling. So we have a product called Net Profiler. It allows you to, on a monthly basis, essentially test your instrument, validate that it is working properly, and if it is drifting slightly, electronics and lamps and those kinds of things drift over time due to environment and use and all those kinds of things, Net Profiler can automatically correct and adjust your instrument to ensure it continues to re measure the same day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year. In, there's annual recertification where the device, if it's a bench top, we can come to your site and do it, or you may be sending the device back to us with handheld devices where, we're an, where we are recertifying them, validating them in our factory that they measure correctly each year during an annual recertification. Um, proper cleaning, we have great um, information and videos that show you how to clean your device to avoid things like dust and, and contamination in the device itself. So to wrap up, there's three basic considerations. One is understand the different geometries, the tools that are available to perform color measurements. Two, ensure the tool fits the requirements of customers, <coughs> excuse me, of your customers and specifications. And third, proper maintenance and care of your spectrometer can ensure accurate and reliable reading. So you want to do all of those things. Be clear and communicate with everybody you're communicating color with what you're using so that everyone's using the same thing. You're not introducing two different geometries to confuse things. And away you go. So as I mentioned, we've got places here you can come, come to our website and learn more. As Robert mentioned in the intro, you may certainly use the questions function on the webinar here to submit your questions and we will be more than happy to get back to you with the, with answers to those questions and with that I thank you for your time and wish you all a very good day thank you <laughs>